I'm an Aboriginal of the Dungari tribe of eastern New South Wales. As a fair-skinned child, I used to look in the mirror, hoping that one day my freckles would join up and I would be a proper Aborigine. Over the years, I discovered how white authorities in Australia try to make us go the other way, towards whiteness. How they attempted to systematically wipe out the Aboriginal race forever. began from the very beginning, that is by individuals, um, right back in the 1790s in New South Wales and the 1810s in Tasmania, within you know, 10 or 20 years of settlement, there were Aboriginal children who in one way or another had been taken from their families and were living with, with Europeans. It didn't become really a government um, process until the 20th century, when of course it was much more serious on a, on a much larger scale. Governments had assumed that Aborigines were dying out, that evolution had dictated that they would eventually disappear. The number of what they call full-blooded Aborigines was declining. It appeared to be proving their scientific theories. It was true Aboriginals were dying in great numbers, but not because evolution had determined it. It was from gunshots poisoned water holes and diseases brought by the settlers. The newspapers, the parliamentary hansards, the diaries, which set out the Australian record plainly and clearly in black and white, show beyond doubt that most whites on the frontier were well aware that Aboriginal people were being murdered in very large numbers. This luxurious Melbourne home is a fairy tale come true for three Aboriginal girls from Melville Island, 180 miles from Darwin. Mr. and Mrs. Deutscher visited the island last year and adopted three Aborigines to bring up with their own three children. Christine is four, and for the first time in her life, she has a mother and father. Two-year-old Faye was rescued by a territory policeman who found her abandoned. They've been cared for by the Methodist mission, and now they live in a 15-room mansion. Mr. Deutscher says he believes it's possible to integrate Aboriginals into white families. Christine certainly seems to be proving that Mr. Deutscher is right, and so does Faye. It's all so new to them, and they're still a little wide-eyed. A long way from Melville Island, but at last a home and the love and affection of a family of their own. Sleep tight, children, because you know that dreams do come true, don't you? How do you determine what is a good intention? I mean, there were certainly people who said, particularly if they saw light-coloured children, and said these children shouldn't be allowed to grow up in the Aboriginal camp. They should be brought into white society uh, and, and their level of civilization raised. That, that was the sort of view. There were also people who thought that the conditions in camps were bad, and as they were. I mean, the, the social, medical conditions of many Aboriginal uh, people was very, very poor. And so people thought, well, it's better if you take the children away. They'll have a better life. And many individuals adopted Aboriginal children on this assumption, we can give them a better life. So good intentions were there, but behind that, particularly in the 1930s and right through into the 1940s, was this, this quite deliberate plan to breed the Aborigines out. Norman B. Tyndale, the physical anthropologist, wrote the theory of race in Australia, and it looks like a stud book. It looks like a breeding manual for animals. If you mix one full blood with one half cast, equals 
a three-quarter cast. One three-quarter cast mixed with one quadroon equals one half cast. And that's published in a scholarly journal, in an anthropological journal. Eugenics was an idea which was extremely important in most Western countries. And the idea was that through breeding, you would improve the race or the nation. That you would breed out bad characteristics with large scale plans. That is, you would sterilize the unfit and that happened widely in many Western countries. And in Australia, it took the form of trying to breed out the colour. Do you like to talk in Tegu? Church was part of our life on the mission, you know, we used to come to church every day. But when you're small, you don't really know, you don't understand really, like what they were doing. So, you know, in a way, we were happy to come here. Getting on the truck and coming, you know, for a long drive somewhere, but we didn't know that that long drive going to last for you know, like this, it'd end up, you know, for a lifetime, really. What made it hard was we had people controlling us all the time, telling us this and that. And we didn't really have our own mind to speak what we wanted to say. We had someone saying it for us or what, you know, but it wasn't us speaking. When Daisy was 16, she married a man who was also on the mission. Other stolen children were afraid of falling in love. Their Aboriginal names had been replaced with English names. They knew how easily they could end up marrying their own brother or sister. Some didn't find out until it was too late. After many years on the mission, all of Daisy's links with her family had been lost. I really feel for May, you know, I know she's my sister, I really love her. But it took so long for us to get together, like, just the first time yesterday, like, we ever talked properly. We never ever talked like that before. So in all those years, that's what I was missing out on.